And hello and welcome to this, the sixth online meeting and the final meeting uh, of the NHS formal public consultation uh, called Modernising Health and Care Services in the Tynmouth and Dawlish area. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kevin Dixon. Uh, let's see, I'm, uh, I'm a patient, I'm a carer and uh, I'm also chair of Health Watch and I've been involved in the voluntary sector in, in South Devon for around 40 years. Uh, my particular role in uh, this meeting is really to sort of facilitate things and act as chair and sort of ensure that as many questions that come in as possible are directed to our panel who you'll meet in a few moments. Uh, the other thing I want to do is to introduce Healthwatch. Uh, Healthwatch is an independent charity. We have the um, statutory role uh, to improve and monitor health and social care in our area. And I've got some um, of my volunteers and my staff members behind the scenes who will be looking at the questions as they actually come in. So we're very much an independent partner. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to do is introduce my fellow panelists. And I think we do have a, um, a slide here, which we do have. And I won't, um, I won't go too much into titles, but we've got Simon Tapley, as you can see on your screen, Liz Davenport, Dr. Paul Johnson, and Dr. Kari uh, Karakusevich. And we'll be meeting uh, those, uh, those four panel members shortly. Uh, what I'd like to do is just briefly go through the agenda so, so people know what's happening this morning. So uh, I've introduced myself. There will be a video, and what that video will be doing is focusing on the current model of care and health and the sort of proposed wellbeing centre in Tynmouth. Then there'll be a presentation by Dr. Paul Johnson, and that'll be on the background of the proposal and the proposal itself. And then we'll come into the real meat of this, which is your opportunity to ask questions um, to, to those panel members. And we'll see, uh, see how that goes. So um, how you actually ask a question uh, or post a comment, so we all so welcome both, is that everybody watching can ask questions or share their views by using the question and answer function in Microsoft Teams. You should see an icon that shows a question mark in a speech bubble with another speech bubble behind it. So if you click on that icon, it'll bring up a panel where you can type a question. So when you've typed that question, uh, just tap or click the paper airplane symbol and send it to us. Uh, and what we'd really like to do is, is, is just give us an idea of who you are. It could just be your first name and that would be fine. And uh, what we're really trying to do is, is get a sort of broad idea of where people are coming from. So possibly put in your postcode. So if I was doing it, it would be um, Kevin TQ12, and that'll give people an idea. Or it could be something like um, Jane Bishop Stainton, uh, Terry Sheldon. So just, just to give, give us a real idea. If you do want to remain anonymous, that's absolutely fine, but it would help if, if you could actually do that. Uh, then my independent Health Watch colleagues behind the scenes will be moderating the post and, and we'll try and aim as, uh, to publish as many as possible. And that's really just to, because we don't want to identify people's names and there might be four or five questions coming in on the same issue, so we can maybe sort of blend those together. Um, if, the, if those moderators want to actually check something with you, they may they may come back to you, they might respond. So to, do keep an eye out for any response in the My Questions section. Uh, you can read the published comments and questions in the Featured tab of the Q&A panel. And we're really trying to publish as many of those questions as we actually can. So the posts are being really checked, as I said before, to make sure there's nothing offensive or any information that we didn't want to identify any particular individual patients. And you can post that any time you want to. So so please, uh, please start now. Uh, we'd also like to let you know that what we're doing is we're recording today's meeting so others can watch it back later. And the recording will be made available on the CCG website. Um, We'd also like to know what you think about this for this meeting format. This is probably the first time we've actually done something because of the COVID situation. So uh, which is bit, which is being done digitally. We want to know how you feel about it, what went well, what didn't go well, how we could improve things. So there'll be a there's a, um, a sort of link there where you can actually you know fill in a few questions. Shouldn't take you too long. And today's meeting will run until 1230. So we hope that's going to be plenty of time. So we'll see how things go. And right, with any further ado, um, we'll move straight into a video. This should explain how the current model of care works and how a health and wellbeing centre uh, hopefully would further support that. So if I can ask colleagues to uh, put that video up. My name is Matthew Fox. I'm a GP in Dawlish. 
I've been a GP for 20 years. I live in Timmouth and I've been supporting the patients at Timmouth and Dawlish for um, 20 years. I spend one day a week working for Torbay Hospital as part of their intermediate care team. Every weekday morning, Monday to Friday, uh, we sit down as a group of professionals. So that's um, a GP, one of the GPs from the local practices. That's our community health team. It involves our occupational therapists, our physios, our community nurses, district nurses, our mental health team as well, um, and our voluntary sector. Our team isn't just statutory NHS services. Having the voluntary sector embedded in the same room at the same time gives us the potential to really support our, you know, our whole community. I'm the intermediate care and therapy lead here at Coastal. Um, and we at the team here work towards ensuring that people in the community are um, kept safe and at home in, um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, my role is very much to support the team in delivering that. So the value of having us all in one room at the same time is really helpful because it's beneficial to bring up not only the people that we discuss as part of intermediate care or in the community, it's about the fact that you can bring anyone to the room and because you've got a wealth of information there and you've got experts in all those different fields, all of us together are able to then figure out the best plan for that patient and on that day. I'm the Community Services Manager for the Coastal Locality, so that means I'm responsible for the health and the social care teams that work out in the community to support people in their own homes, staying as independent as possible. Enabling um, cross-working between voluntary sector, health, social care and primary care um, is, is absolutely vital in, in us being able to progress our services to um, at the next level. I'm the Community Nurse Manager for the Coastal Locality. My job involves um, overseeing the work of the community nurses and also the intermediate care nurses and the nurses that work in long term conditions. So the aim is to have an oversight over the coastal locality of patient need and matching the right nurse to the right patient. I'm Liam, one of the coastal health and wellbeing coordinators. Our main role is to deal with the incoming referrals via phone and telephone and liaise with all the patients, relatives and various departments to gather information for the team to um, assess what a patient situation is like and what, what input they need from our team. Traditionally, people have thought of medicine being you go and see your GP, if you're poorly you go to hospital, when you are better you go back home again. And the only place you could have your care was in you know, a traditional hospital. The world has really moved on and there's really good evidence that actually if you can support people in their own home, you can actually support more patients than you could just in, in a traditional hospital ward. So for us, integrated care is actually how do we bring all the parts of our system together to work more powerfully on behalf of our patients. People in Tynmouth and Dawlish are being urged to have their say about the shape of future health and care services once a new £8 million health and wellbeing centre is built in the heart of Tynmouth. Torbay and South Devon NHS Foundation Trust is planning to build a state-of-the-art new health facility so that GP services health and care and voluntary sector services can be brought together under one roof in the centre of town, providing seamless care for patients and carers. To have a, a centre um, that is actually on the level in town, a designed building that we've all been involved with, um, will really enable us to join up the relationships and the understanding of each other's roles and the pressures on the different areas will really, really help that, that working in terms of how we link together to support clients going forward. The Health and Wellbeing Centre would obviously be a new purpose-built building, so the room size would be government specified, there would be excellent access and good access for disabled people, which would be a considerable change to what we have now. We, I have been involved in the planning of this building for the last four years. We have had many, many meetings to discuss how it should be built. And we think the building we've come up with will provide everything that is needed to enable many multidisciplinary teams to work in the same building. So we'll be able to talk to social workers, occupational therapists, um, physiotherapists, pharmacists, and I think that will hugely improve the communication for all the healthcare in Timber to the benefit of both patients and staff.
I think the really exciting thing about the, um, combining all of our services in one place is that ability to communicate with one another. It's that sharing of one big room and that sharing of knowledge. By having your general practice and your voluntary sector and your care teams in the same place, you, know, you can't help but actually you know, in, um, support those patients in, in at the best possible fashion. When we think, well, why wouldn't you want them all to be working in the same place to give that sharing and support to each other? You can find out more by visiting the Devon CCG website. Right, thank you very much for that. Uh, now, the, the next person on is if I could introduce Dr. Paul Johnson, uh, who will be just talking about uh, that the, and giving a presentation on the proposals. Uh, Paul. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, uh, yes, as Kevin said, my name is Paul Johnson. I'm a GP uh, and I'm also chair of uh, the Clinical Commissioning Group. And uh, for many years, I've been uh, a GP practicing in the South Devon area in, in Newton Abbott. Firstly, thank you. As Kevin said, thank you for uh, for coming along, spending your Saturday morning uh, here in the uh, in in this in, in this consultation meeting. Uh, and I'm looking forward to not only having this opportunity to explain to you the journey that we've been on that gets us to this point, uh, but also to have that discussion and that conversation around how we make sure that we provide the best care uh, for the population of Tynmouth uh, and Dawlish. So. Timoth and Dawlish is being talked about. It's being talked about in Devon, it's being talked about across the country. And the reason it's being talked about is because what you just saw uh, in the video, uh, that, uh, the, uh, that the services that you are benefiting from in the community, in your own homes, are showing uh, some really good outcomes for you uh, that other areas are wanting to learn from and potentially copy. So that's really good news that you're setting uh, your front runners in, in, in what's being uh, developed uh, in order to keep people well uh, and healthy. So why are we coming to you with a, with a, with a consultation? Well, there are really several reasons uh, for change uh, and I'm gonna go through those in these next few slides. The first reason for change is because of this new way of working that you've just seen, we can meet the needs of the people of Timoth and Dawlish in a new way. So the services that you're getting have been reviewed by Plymouth University and by the Clinical Senate as part of NHS England, and they have found that it is really good news for you that by receiving care in your own homes with this multidisciplinary team, what we call the inter intermediate care team, that you're less likely to need to go into hospital that when you do have to go into hospital, you stay there for a shorter period of time. And that when you receive your care in your own home, you feel more in control of your own health and well-being. The longer term benefits have also been seen in that you are much less likely to end up needing to leave your own homes and go into either a residential home or a nursing care home. So it's really good news that we can get, keep people at home and when people need to go into hospital, they come back early and supported because there is good evidence that the longer you spend in a hospital bed, the more detrimental that is to both your physical well-being and also to your mental health. The second reason, uh, as you've heard from several of the GPs in the uh, in the video, is that our GPs, your GPs, are currently working uh, in buildings where they're struggling to do so in a way that can provide the modern care that you need, that can attract people to come and train and attract new doctors and new healthcare professionals to come uh, and work in Tynmouth and Dawlish. And you want the, the pick of the crop when it comes to GPs uh, and, and nurses uh, and pharmacists so that you get the best care that you can. The surgeries that they work from, and uh, you'll meet Dr. Kara Kusevich soon, who works uh, in this surgery here, Channel View, and many of you uh, may know her. And, and she will say uh, exactly how much of a struggle it is to provide the care, particularly without the disabled access, for you in the current buildings that they have. So we build a new health and wellbeing centre. It'll provide purpose-built general practice facilities that can not only mean that you get the GP surgery care that you need, but it'll be in the same building as the health and social care team, uh, and it'll be in the town centre, 
with parking on a level surface with disabled access. So the advantages to GP surgeries and the way you get your general practice would be significant should we have that building. The third reason is that we need to make the most of our local NHS buildings and we need to make sure that we provide value for money. So Tynmouth Community Hospital has served you well for many, many years. And I'm sure many of you have got some really good stories of the way that either you or your relatives have been cared for in that building. But it is not up to the modern standards that we need to carry on providing health care. And if we wanted to bring it up to modern standards, if we did the work that was needed around disabled access, around privacy, around engineering, it would cost in the region of one and a half million pounds to do. Not only that, but even if we brought it up to that standard, the running costs for a building that is older like this are far greater than the running costs for a modern premises. The day case uh, unit uh, that is within Timmouth Hospital, and we'll see a picture of that in a few slides time, is also not up to modern standards. It's not large enough and it doesn't have the facilities necessary for us to be able to do all those day case procedures that you benefit from in the most modern and safe way. Now, on the other hand, Dawlish Community Hospital and this proposed Health and Wellbeing Centre are and will be modern premises. They'll have more space and they'll have all those access uh, abilities and facilities necessary uh, that we struggle with at the moment with Tynmouth Hospital. The fourth reason for change is that the, the, we want to make sure that we get all the services working together in a seamless way for you so that you tell your story once that health professionals talk to each other about you and that those in the voluntary sector, those who are working within the community teams in social services and in primary care can all have the necessary conversations they need for you to receive your care. And that is best done under one roof. Just ask any of your GPs or your community nurses or your therapists and they will tell you what a huge advantage that is to being able to look after you. And that fits with both the national strategy and you can hear, see some of the examples here on the slide, but also what we want to do as a CCG, uh, as an NHS system in the whole of Devon, is bring all of those services together. Now, over the years, you have really helped us uh, develop the services, get the services to the point where they are now, and also to shape our view of where we should go from here. And it all goes back to 2013, when we initially had that engagement with you that developed the community services. And actually it was so successful that in 2014 and 15, we took that uh, approach and had similar conversations throughout South Devon uh, and Torbay. We then had um, uh, another discussion with you and the most recent one was two years ago, where we talked to you about how we can continue to deliver for those really good services in the community uh, and what we should do around some of those other services that we needed to continue given some of the challenges that we had with the buildings that we were currently using. So thank you for many years of being actively involved uh, in this process. And so in combination of what you've had to say to us and some of those reasons for change that I've just been through, we developed our vision. And this is the vision of the NHS uh, for you in Tynmouth and Dawlish, to make sure that we provide excellent integrated services. And that means that we build on the success we've seen so far, that you've seen in the video, that the University of Plymouth have seen, and that I've just described uh, in the previous slides. We need to make sure that primary care in Tynmouth is not just sustainable, but it thrives and it gives you the best quality service for many years to come. We want people to stay well and we want to support them when they need help. And we want to make sure that people manage to stay in their own homes independently or with help for as long as possible. So to help deliver that vision, firstly, we want to build this health and wellbeing centre. It'll be in the heart of Dinmouth, Tynmouth. It'll bring together Channel View Medical Group, the GPs, It'll bring together the health and well-being team, volunteering in health, all into that single accessible building. And that's the opportunity to integrate those teams and to get them talking and working together. It'll have more space, 
so that we can do things like that training of healthcare professionals. We can attract more uh, people into the area to be working with and for you. And we can also have extra services who can come in on a drop in basis to offer you even more variety of service and support. It's going to be a great place to work. It'll attract people. It'll mean that those people working there will be in modern, bright and sustainable building. It'll be, as we said, on level surface with disabled access so that you can get to it uh, and access it really easily. Now, developing this health and wellbeing centre gives us the opportunity to ask, what do we do with the other services that are currently being provided in Timworth Community Hospital? And that brings us to the proposal that we're coming to you with in this consultation. We have one proposal because we think that this gives the best chance of delivering the best quality of care for you. And it's comprised of four elements. And over these next four slides, I'll just go through what those four elements are. The first element is to take those high use community clinics that are currently in Timworth Community Hospital and to host those and for those to be delivered in this new health and wellbeing centre in Timworth. Now, those high use clinics, they are they make up about three quarters of the total outpatient appointments currently happening in Timworth Hospital, and the majority of those are used by the people living in the Timworth uh, and Dorish area, and that's predominantly audiology, physiology, uh, physiotherapy and podiatry. We would also, it makes sense for the ear, nose and throat outpatient clinics to also move to the same location because they are so closely related and interdependent with audiology. The second proposal is for those specialist outpatient clinics that are currently in Timberth Community Hospital, for those to move to Dorlish Community Hospital, which is four miles away. And you can see on the slide uh, the various different uh, specialist clinics that currently happen. Now they account for about a quarter of the total appointments, but as you can see from the slide, the majority of people who access and benefit from these clinics are from the wider Tim uh, South Devon and Torbay geography. Dawlish Community Hospital has spare space. We've assessed it and it can accommodate all of these clinics. And actually when we move them, we don't need to change the day or the times of those clinics being provided. The third element of our uh, proposal is to move those day case procedures that are currently being provided in Tinworth Community Hospital over to Dawlish Community Hospital. Now you can see that uh, those fall under three categories, those for oral surgery, for pain management and for plastic surgery. And people come from all over South Devon and Torbay to benefit from these and would continue to do so. I said I'd, I'd, we'd, we'd see a little bit about what the current day case procedure room is in Timoth Hospital and you can see a photo of that. And it does show that it is a small, it is a cramped space, it is not fit for, 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 for future provision of modern uh, day case procedures. So we would intend to spend around £360,000 creating a day case procedure room at Tornish Community Hospital that would meet modern standards. The fourth element of our proposal would be to continue with what we are providing in the community, that community based intermediate care provision, but that we would reverse the decision to establish those 12 rehabilitation beds in Tynmouth Community Hospital. The plan was not for them to be hospital medical beds, but they would be staffed by therapists, supported by healthcare workers to provide the same sort of services that people are currently benefiting from, from in their own homes. Why are we proposing this? Well, as we can see from the evidence and from what I mentioned earlier, that people are more likely to regain their independence the less time they spend in the hospital bed and the more time they spend at home. So if we can provide them with that therapy care in their own homes rather than hospital, they are much more likely to make a fuller recovery. The other issue is that the team that provides that care, if they were to be in the community rather than in the hospital, they will be able to look after four times as many people in their own homes than those who would be in those hospital beds and that would be for the same investment. So if we were to open those rehab beds, we would be in a position where fewer people would be able to get the support in their own homes because some of those team would have to move to be working on this ward. Now we asked the Southwest Clinical Centre to review that 
And they came to the conclusion that was consistent with this, that did demonstrate that the care that needed to be provided was being met in the community and that they agreed that there didn't seem to be a need for these 12 rehabilitation beds on top of whatever is what also is being provided. So just a recap of those proposals. To move those high use community clinics, that podiatry physiotherapy uh, to, from Timber Community Hospital to the Health and Wellbeing Centre. For those specialist outpatient clinics to go from Tinmouth Community Hospital to Dawlish Community Hospital. Those day case procedures to move also from Tinmouth to Dawlish Community Hospital in a new purpose built day case unit and to continue with that community based intermediate care service, which is which is delivering so much for the people of Timmouth and Dawlish, but to change our decision to reverse the decision that we made in our initial consultation with you that said that we would establish those 12 rehabilitation beds in Timmouth Community Hospital. Now, what we have been asked to do is to review that proposal since COVID came and posed us with a significant issue, and we've done that. And the conclusion that we've made is that that doesn't change what we should be doing for you. So in COVID-19, there are two things that we need to be able to provide as far as hospitals are concerned. One is to make sure that we've got that emergency capacity to look after people when they become acutely well, unwell. And we have our four hospitals throughout uh, Devon, and we've also got the Nightingale Hospital in Exeter. And combined, they can provide that care for people should they need to go into hospital if they become unwell from COVID. The other thing that we need to make sure that we provide is for those people who need longer to recover before they can get home. And one of the key things that we need to make sure is present is that they can get oxygen, which can't be at the moment provided at Tinworth Community Hospital. But also the second thing is that they can be cared for in an environment where we can do all of those things around social distancing and infection control to make sure they and the staff caring for them are kept safe. And because of the way that Timworth Hospital is built and designed, it makes it extremely difficult for us to be able to do it there compared to some of the more modern community hospital facilities that we have. And the third thing is that if COVID-19 and the need for that infection control continues for a long time, and we don't know how long it will be with us, but that both the Health and Wellbeing Centre that we propose and Dawlish Community Hospital do have the ability to provide those services in a safe environment with all the infection controls necessary. So we want you to get involved. You're here, you're part of this, uh, this discussion this morning, uh, and so you are definitely involved. You hopefully will have seen the consultation document come through your door or one of the leaflets. I'd encourage you to fill out the survey either in the document or online. Um, we can come to one of your community meetings if you wish, but understandably we are trying to do as many things as remote as possible because of coronavirus. You're here joining our online meetings, but we're happy to talk to you on the phone or you can go through the website or email us if you have any other things that you would want to discuss. So thank you for your time this morning. Uh, I'm going to hand back to Kevin now and I look forward to the discussion over the next few minutes. Thank you. OK, okay thank you, thank you. Johnson. Um, um, Ross, what we're what going to do, we're going do now, to now is move to the uh, question and answer session. Uh, uh, and what I'm really trying to do is address every specific question which is relevant to consultation and uh, what I would ask the, um, the panellists to do is to, uh, and somebody mentioned this before, is to try and keep away from jargon as actually as much as possible. Uh, so we've got folks behind the scenes that are sort of looking at your questions, but when they repeat a previous one or more than one to receive on the same subject, one answer may be kind of used to, in response to several separate questions. Uh, now, we're, we're very well aware that uh, some of those questions we might not be able to, to answer immediately. That could be something on statistics and, you know, and answers may not be uh, easily ready. So what we're trying to do is uh, we'll, we'll let you know and the CCG will post a response in the frequently asked questions section on the website after the meeting. So do keep an eye on that. And um, we've got the ad uh, address we've given you um, earlier. And I'd like to now uh, give an opportunity for the panel to introduce themselves. Paul already has done. 
Uh, and another another comment that came in from previous meetings is is if each panel member could give a very sort of brief introduction to themselves, what their job role is, what their responsibilities are. And so could I um, ask the panel to introduce themselves? OK, okay. Um, so I'm uh, I'm Simon Tapley. I'm the accountable officer of Devon CCG. I've worked for the health service for 27 years. Uh, born in Paynton, never lived outside of uh, Devon, so I think that makes me a good person to uh, be working inside Devon. Others may uh, may uh, challenge that, um, but I've worked in various commissioning uh, positions for the last 15-16 um, years, including being a director in um, South Devon and Torbay um, from its inception of a, a clinical commissioning group in 2012. Um, until current day now being the um, accountable officer for Devon um, Clinical Commissioning Group. Hello, um, good morning everyone. My name is Liz Davenport and I'm the Chief Executive of Torbay and South Devon Foundation Trust. I've worked um, in um, healthcare for over 30 years. Um, I started off my career in the NHS as an occupational therapist, uh, working in a number of different settings, including mental health settings. I've worked um, at Tall Bay now for six years and have been really keen to work alongside um, the skilled and really experienced staff in Tall Bay to um, deliver health and care for the population of Tall Bay in South Devon. Look forward to having our conversation today. Right, thank you very much panel. And now we've got a number of questions that have already come up. And I'll start off, this is anonymous, uh, which is fine. Um, uh, right. Uh, could the CCG clarify which GP practices will be going into the proposed health centre? Uh, the document states that the building will include, uh, quote, two GP practices, the health and wellbeing team and volunteering in health. And all that might go straight back to you, Carly, I think. Hello. Um, good morning. My name is Carly Karakasevich. I'm a GP. Um, I've been a GP partner at Channel View Medical Group for 27 years and um, working in Tynmouth uh, throughout that time. Um, so to answer the that first question of which uh, who's going to be in this building, um, the, uh, the the practice that's going to be in the building is my own Channel View Medical Group that provides GP services to uh, just short of 18,000 patients in the local community. Um, if I'll just uh, expand the answer slightly to uh, give a bit of context, if you don't mind. Um, the, uh, the inception, the beginning of the development of this building started in 2016, when at that stage there were four practices in Tynmouth, and we all together uh, put a bid to NHS England and was successful in securing funds, um, just over a million pounds to go towards this development. Um, general practice is a changing feast and now there aren't four practices in Timoth anymore. The, the two practices referred to in the document are actually made are, are my own practice because that came was formed from two different practices, Channel View Surgery and Timoth Medical Group. We merged on the 1st of April 2020 and formed Channel View Medical Group. Um, and just in case it helps um, the audience, the, the, the practices, the patients who would be attending this building for GP services would be the Tynmouth based patients. Um, our branch surgeries in Bishop Stainton and Shudley are unaffected, as are the patients who attend uh, the branch surgery of Tynmouth um, Estuary Medical Group who are in Shoulden. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, if any other sort of panel members want to come in and apologies to Carly for not letting you introduce yourself. I had a bit of a computer glitch this end and just went went funny for a, little, for a few seconds. Right. Um, next one. Anonymous. Uh, surely the COVID experience has changed the healthcare scene in ways that cannot yet be fully understood. Uh, so is this an appropriate time to start meddling with systems? It would seem logical to stand down the CCG consultation uh, until the pandemic runs its course. Um, ooh, straight to Simon, I think, and then Liz may want to come in in a moment. Yeah, thanks, um, Kevin. So, so just the um, just to start on um, the running a consultation during the pandemic, because I think um, we were all um, slightly nervous about how uh, how this would uh, would work. But actually, we tested this out with both 
overview and scrutiny committees um, in Devon and in Torbay and with um, uh, other experts across the country and we're now being told that this is actually going to be a blueprint for how consultations could work in the future. Um, we've received quite a lot of feedback already in fact more than we would have um, expected to in a in a normal consultation so that we've been really pleased with that now the the question talks about um the covid experience and not um not knowing everything that um that's happened but we've um we've obviously had one wave of the pandemic pandemic in um march and april and through to may we learned quite a lot about um, how um, how the disease operates and and what sort of infection control measures we need to put in place to be able to deal with it. What what we'd say is there's an imperative at the moment around um, the timing of of this uh, of this consultation and any any changes. So people of Timoth and Dorish will know that the development is being pushed ahead um, in Brunswick Square, and to be able to take advantage of that, there is a time bound pressure. It's also important to know that the Health and Wellbeing Centre won't be won't be built and complete until about 2022. Um, so we won't be actually moving services and it is about moving services, not stopping services. So we need to reiterate that until um, uh, that time anyway. So we won't be looking to move services in the pandemic. But I think the point is well made that we need to um, be cognizant of that. And I think Paul covered that in his um, in his presentation. So I don't know if Liz wants Thank to you. add anything. I'll be really brief because Simon, I think, has been really comprehensive. I guess one of the things that we have learned from our, um, an NHS trust provider perspective is the importance of having uh, accommodation which is um, flexible and is uh, and where we can meet the appropriate infection prevention and control um, guidance and uh, modern flexible buildings are, uh, enable us to adapt much more readily to changes in circumstance so we see this as a, a welcome opportunity to be, become more adaptable um, to the needs of our population going forward thank you thank you for your question okay thank you right uh, question three uh, this is from James and Tinmouth. Uh, do changes in the way things are done since COVID, and uh, we're looking at virtual meetings, that kind of thing, uh, mean that being in the same building is as important as it was before COVID? Oh, um, Liz. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a, a really um, good question because I think um, a, a few months ago, uh, a very few of us would have anticipated we'd be doing what we're doing today, which is sitting um, on, on in front of a screen, talking to a, a significant number of people in our population. And we've certainly been using digital technology to really enhance our ability to meet the needs of our local people and to think about how we work together. However, it is one aspect of how we work. And what we know is really important is how our clinical staff come together to think and plan uh, around the needs of our local people. And I think in Paul's presentation, he talked really eloquently around the kind of bringing together of the voluntary sector, the therapy team, the social care team, primary care, to think about what's the right solution. And that is delivered really effectively when people come together in formal and informal settings. The other thing I would say is, you know, one of the opportunities we have when you bring people together is you can actually have a bit of a one stop shop. So you might have a an appointment to see your GP, um, but being able to um, coordinate that with maybe seeing a physio appointment. And we're really keen to make sure that we make the best use of people's time as well in terms of how we deliver care in this centre, because face to face contact is still going to be a very important feature of how care is delivered into the future. But um, helpful question. Thank you. Carly, did you want to come in on that one or? Um, yeah, briefly, um, I won't uh, reiterate everything that Liz has said, but um, I would I would concur absolutely. Um, what we're, I think we have to be wary of planning for the immediate now. Um, this building is planning for the future and improving services for the population going forwards. Um, and although we are obviously um, very aware of what we're needing to do right now with um, turning a lot of care virtual, um, we do need to be um, sure that we we don't lose everything we did before. And I think going forwards, what we'll be looking at is a mix of still keeping some virt some virtual um, working where it's appropriate but um, re re um, restarting the face-to-face -face meetings um, that Liz was describing and obviously also bringing people back into the building when it's safe to do so. 
OK, thank you. Right. Um, this is from Ray. Um, let's see. It's, it's a comment and, and some questions. So right. Uh, schools and other essential services such as uh, firefighting will struggle if COVID-19 cases are allowed to continue to continue to rise. Essential services could be seriously affected, even decimated in areas with the highest infection rates unless intelligent measures are taken to bring the epidemic under control. High levels of key workers falling sick will have its own consequences too. We are currently faced with our health systems being extremely challenged. Already there has been talk of hospitals being unable to cope uh, with the rapidly increasing number of COVID cases expected. With the likelihood of future significant challenges, should we not learn some lessons here, rethink reorganisation plans that seek to close another highly valued South Devon Community Hospital that aim to contract um, rather than expand our health services and instead make plans to invest in and utilise all existing NHS community hospitals and reopen those previously closed. And yes, develop GP services too. Paul, I think this one's for you. Uh, uh, thanks, Kieran. So um, I, I think you're, you're right. If if this uh, if this if this pandemic is left uh, to to run a course without appropriate measures, um, we frequently have meetings with the within the NHS that actually it will put serious strain on our services and on our population. Um, those measures that are in place, both nationally and locally, are, um, are well uh, well rehearsed. Um, you can hear them on the news. You can see them on the Devon County Council website, uh, and the same with um, uh, Torbay website. Um, so, so those are in place, and actually, no one is talking about just letting it run its course. There will be things to bring that under control. Um, I think the, the 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 bit that's probably relevant to this consultation is. So, so why are we having a discussion where it seems as though we are narrowing our offer? Um, and I think actually what's more relevant, and Simon touched on this, is actually we are looking at how do we make sure that we spend the money that we have available within the NHS in the most efficient way, giving as much service and much appropriate service to people. And it's about the services we provide rather than necessarily the buildings that we provide them from. And uh, and what we do know is that many people who have COVID need their hospital and we touched on that and touched on the reasons why uh, we need hospitals available, but we need hospitals that can provide their care in a safe way with the facilities necessary and why Tynmouth Community Hospital would struggle to do that. But we also know that there's going to be a lot of people and it's becoming more and more evident as we grow in our experience who get coronavirus, who recover from it, but then have long term uh, symptoms and long term problems as a result and they need ongoing help and support. And what I hope we've been able to describe and what we and what I as a, as a GP genuinely believe in is that the more that we can provide that care in someone's own home, the greater the chance for them to be able to recover and the more people that we can look after. So if we have a large number of people needing long term support or in, in as a result of COVID, we're investing in the right place, which is in the community, in their own homes, which, you know, as we saw in the video, as we saw with the evidence uh, that Plymouth University found, actually does lead to some really good benefits and some really good outcomes uh, for the population. So I think I, I don't believe if I thought we were narrowing our services and you know providing less services, I wouldn't be here doing this consultation. I genuinely think it's an opportunity for us to build on the things that are already working well. Right, thank you. Um, uh, right, um, this is from Terry in EX7. Uh, when will the Minor Injuries Unit currently closed at Dawlish um, be reopened and will it contain uh, con continue to uh, continue to operate, I think, at Dawlish Community Hospital after the reorganisation. Uh, Liz. Thank you. Um, and, and this is a question that's come up in a, a couple of our conversations um, previously. So uh, it links a bit to what Paul's been talking about as a as a consequence of COVID and the restrictions that we have to put in place. And ha um, we have had to make the decision to temporarily suspend the services uh, both at Totnes and at Dawlish. 
Um, I would stress this is a temporary arrangement to enable us to use our staff in areas where we're able to maintain the appropriate standards around IPC and, um, and uh, social distancing. But the intention is as soon as we're at a position to be able to stand down that COVID response, um, we, will, um, we will be um, reinstating those services, which are commissioned services by the CCG and therefore um, something that we are committed to continue to deliver for that community. Right, thank you. And um, I believe there was a, a session on uh, BBC News last night about this. So it's a very hot topic. Uh, this is from Anon. Um, all these care home promises are being made at a time when there's a huge national sort of, uh, shortage of nurses and carers. So they're fantasy, aren't they? Um, Liz, back to you. Thank you. And I'm going to um, draw Simon in a little while because Simon does quite a bit of work around workforce and how we develop our workforce. It's a really important point, isn't it? And I know it's in the in the news quite a quite a bit. So I think one of the real advantages for us as an integrated care organisation is we work with a whole range of other people. So the workforce um, includes very importantly our skilled nurses, but also we work alongside social workers, therapists, uh, and the voluntary sector, to name a few, uh, including our primary care colleagues. So our response is a multidisciplinary response to the needs of our local community. And we know that we can support far more people uh, in a community setting than we can do in a hospital setting uh, by kind of uh, by fourfold the number of people that can be supported, which is really important. Alongside that, um, we absolutely take seriously our responsibility as employer. In fact, we are a big Toolbane South Devon's the biggest employer in um, Torbay and South Devon area and we have been working very closely with our colleges, with the universities, with the local um, job centres, with our local community leaders to ensure that we have effective pathways to bring people into the organisation and importantly develop their skills. The apprenticeship programme for example has been a real real benefit to us locally because we've been able to train a whole range of people that when they do come into service are able to progress their careers and stay with us. Um, alongside that, things like the Proud to Care programme that we've been working very closely with our local authority um, colleagues has um, been a really important um, part of bringing the workforce in and training and supporting that workforce. And as a big employer, we also can create career development opportunities, which we know is really important in terms of attracting the right people, but also keeping the right people. So we can't be complacent about it, but I think that our view is the model supports us to do far more in the community. Working collaboratively with the multidisciplinary team helps us to do more. And we take our, our responsibilities for training and developing um, young people at a, a really um, important time in people, you know, with COVID, with the current employment situation, so that we create those job opportunities for people to come into health and care. Uh, Simon, I don't know if I've missed anything. Uh, so only only a couple of things, um, uh, Liz. So I'm so I'm the workforce senior responsible officer across the whole of the county. I've been working with colleagues on this. So to add, to add, uh, I think possibly three things. Um, so we've uh, we've been working with our further education colleges and universities on um, new methods of delivery for nursing, particularly nursing qualifications. So nursing apprenticeships. Um, two of the things that were really um, that we'd, been, we'd had feedback that were um, stopping people actually going into uh, nursing uh, nursing uh, roles and nursing qualifications were around um, not having access to virtual um, uh, learning opportunities. So obviously, with the pandemic, that has changed considerably. With universities and FE colleges doing much more virtually. Um, and also not having the ability to earn money whilst you're learning, so earn to um, learn whilst you earn. Um, and the, you know, like I say, we've been working really hard with FE colleges and universities to get that right, and we're looking to increase the number of placements across Devon um, by 600 a year over the next four years. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is um, what, what we, I think Liz uh, mentioned during the pandemic, obviously um, both health and care became very attractive um, propositions for, for people. And we've had a lot of returners return to practice, um, which has increased the number of um, people that we've got available to, um, to work uh, for us across our patch. So that's, uh, that's another benefit for us. Um, and lastly, the number of different roles that we are working on with, as, as Liz said, multidisciplinary teams, but new roles such as um, physicians associates, nursing associates, um, and some of the other clinical roles that we are, um, we are developing 
um, uh, and we are leaders in some of those um, across this county to be able to help us and deliver a different workforce than we've um, than we've had in the past. Right. OK, uh, next one, uh, James and Tinmouth. Um, uh, I'm sure it's been raised before and it certainly has James and, and every one of these sessions we've had. Uh, I'm sure it's been raised before, but what are the parking options going to be for staff and patients using the new centre? If this is not resolved, it will be a nightmare for the town centre and anybody using the building. And I think that's straight back to you, Liz, I think. Something that's come up um, in probably all of the conversations we've had over the last um, few weeks. We don't underestimate how important it is, not just the people using the centre, our staff, but also the local population. Um, so from our perspective, one of the reasons that we were quite attracted to having a centre in the middle of um, Timoth itself is it does create us other opportunities, including using public transport. Um, and actually in other sessions, people have also encouraged us to think not just about public transport, but how could we improve access for people that might want to cycle um, to the centre and use appropriate you know, safe storage for bicycles when they come and use it, which we absolutely will take away. Um, we know also that um, it's not not convenient for everybody to come either on public transport or to cycle. So we are working really closely with the council, not only to look at how we can create the right design features to optimise um, people being able to drop off, for example, at the front door, but also how we can create additional car parking solutions in the local area. Um, so it is a difficult one. Undoubtedly, it's a difficult one, but the combination of public transport, alternative strategies, and working with the council to try and find other answers is the approach that we're taking to this one. Thank you. Okay, um, next one from Penny. One of the reasons given for building a new state-of-the-art health and wellbeing centre in Tynmouth is to provide more integrated joined up care in the community. The new building would only consist of a GP surgery, four community clinics and volunteer services, while it is clear that local GP services need modernising, surely public money invested into the refurbishment and reinstatement of Tynmouth Community Hospital, complete with um, MIU, X-ray service and the 12 rehabilitation beds, would be a far better solution to improving local joined up healthcare. Has this option been considered and why have the comparative costs not been made public? Um, Simon? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I just wanted to say, actually, Kevin, that if um, members of the public watching are seeing me go across, the questions are coming in onto an iPad between Liz and I. So um, it's not that we're being rude, it's that we're trying to read the questions as they come. So in in terms of that, so just wanted to say it's not it's not just those groups. So voluntary sector, physio, OT, no, nurses, social workers, pharmacists, GPs, so it's actually quite a right, wide range of um, professions would be at the health and wellbeing um, centre. So it's important to stress that I don't want people to think it's a narrow group of staff because it's not. In terms of the other um, aspects, we uh, most of you will know we held a consultation back in 2015 where we discussed all the um, options and the pros and cons of um, both MIUs and uh, hospital services in Tynmouth and Dawlish. So I wouldn't want to um, rerun that. I think the points were well made about um, staff, particularly in MIUs, having to have enough um, throughput, enough patients present to keep their skills um, up to date. And I think the point was well made and accepted by uh, clinical colleagues and and the and the public. In terms of the all of the options around the rehab um, beds have been considered and are included in the supporting documents on the website and in the consultation pack. So people, you know, people have them available and can and can look at those. But um, the the cost of um, being able to put the rehab beds um, into Timoth Hospital is stated in that uh, in those documents. But as I think Paul said and Liz has reiterated, the number of people we can look after at home. Um, is much, uh, much in excess of if we just have the 12 beds in Timberth Hospital. OK, anybody else or we'll leave there? OK, uh, and this this one, this links in, the next one links in quite nicely. Um, this is from Ray. Uh, in today's world, coastal towns uh, require up and running full hospital services. This consultation was dreamed up in pre-COVID-19 times. The current experience of Liverpool and other towns uh, where it is now recognised there is a lack of hospital capacity point to the need for the NHS and hospital services to be protected, developed and expanded. Uh, why is the Devon CCG still pushing ahead with consultation proposals 
that completely run contrary to and completely ignore the current realities and the severe challenges to be met in the future. Um, Paul? Um, uh, thanks, Kieran. And and I think those you're right in that we pulled together the um, uh, the proposal before uh, the first wave of COVID hit us. Um, we did go back and we had a look at it and we asked, is this still the right proposal? And is this still the right time to go out with this proposal? I think we've we've been through that a few times and, and we still think for lots of reasons it is. We can't sit still with our future plans whilst we ta tackle COVID. We've got to tackle both the here and now and the future at the same time. And that's the challenge that we're trying to balance. And hence, that's why we're here this morning. Um, I think with regards to what what this is teaching us, both both COVID, but also all the increasing other things that we have to do within the NHS, they're teaching us that the way we've always done things isn't going to work. We're never going to have the staff and the buildings and the beds and the resources to do what we do now, but just more of it with more people living older, with more people needing some of those uh, care for the, some of those long term conditions or some of those you know, surgical treatments that they will need. So what we've learned over a number of years is things that used to be done for people in hospital can now, and, and they'd have to come in and spend a, and be in a bed can now be done as a day case. Some of those things that we were able to had to do as a day case, we can now do in an outpatient clinic. And some of those things that people had to go to hospital for, we can now do for them out in the community. And each one of those means that we can do it more efficiently and we can treat more people with the same amount of resource that we've got. And that's why the whole drive to what we're doing is making sure that that what we can do in the community in Dawlish and Tynmouth is as good as it possibly can be. And the more we invest in what we can put into the community, the more space we can create in those fit for purpose modern hospital buildings that uh, so that they can carry on doing the services where people absolutely need to be in hospital. But let's only get people in hospital when they really need to. And let's make sure we've got all the resources we need so that when people can be at home, that we can keep them at home and support them there. So you're right, there's more and more pressures coming our way, but we've got to do things in a different way in order to do the right thing for you and to be sustainable given the limited resources that we have within the NHS. Right, thank you. Uh, next one's anonymous. Uh, quote, uh, why are such desperate promises being made? Typically, they want to build a new medical centre in an area that's going to become increasingly prone to flooding. Climate change is guaranteed. The CCG are a joke. Um, the, uh, the flooding thing's come up before. Uh, Liz, do you want to uh, answer that one on flooding? Yeah, if I pick up the flooding issue, and you're right, this is uh, an issue that has been raised before. And and importantly, this is an issue not just for the design of this building, but for the wider kind of centre of um, Timmouth, which we know has um, flooding risk attached to it. Um, the opportunity that we have, you know, for us is in designing a building is to design something that mitigates that risk. And certainly we're working really closely with the planning department and experts in this field to make sure that we design something where we minimise that risk. And as health and care providers, you know, we're really experienced in building, um, making arrangements that ensure continuity of services um, when we have such challenges. So, you know, I would reassure you this is something we're very aware of working with the experts on to make sure that we minimise any risk. And, and just on the on the on the last bit, it would be remiss of me to um, leave a comment like the CCG or a joke um, without commenting um, back. But it's really important that these people remember these proposals have been independently clinically reviewed by the Clinical Senate, which are um, clinicians that go across the whole of the southwest. So people have to submit that. They check the evidence base, how things work together, qualifications, et cetera, et cetera. And they, the process for consultation has also been through both Torbay and South De and Devon's overview and scrutiny. So um, whatever you may think of the CCG, there has been independent verification too. And obviously Healthwatch, um, Kevin in the chair today, are also reviewing all of the comments that come back about the consultation. So. Like I say, whatever you think of the CCG, there is plenty of independence to um, to the process. OK, thank you. Um, right, next one from Penny. Uh, the likely decision by Torbay and South uh, Devon Hospital Foundation Trust to close Tynmouth Hospital appears like an afterthought at the end of the CCG consultation proposal. If the hospital is closed and sold off, another publicly owned and run NHS hospital will be lost forever. 
to the community and to the country. The proposed new health and wellbeing centre will be financed partially by private money and the local hospitals that are being left untouched and or being expanded like Newton Abbott and Dawlish Hospital were all built with money from PFI contracts. Are these new developments in Tynmouth another move on the slippery slope towards NHS privatisation? Uh, this has come up before. Um, Simon, would you like to respond? Uh, so, so no. So it's not a um, it's not a PFI um, uh, process as as we would have known them back um, back was formed under previous uh, previous governments. So the the trust will be the lease holder. It's a thirty year lease, and at the end of that thirty year lease, they will own the own the building. Is that right, Liz? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anonymous. Uh, given that the primary care network workforce is intended to expand over the next four years, possibly by 20 people and that the staff in the surgery are increasing and the proposed hospital staff moving in too, it is essential that the new premises can be extended in the future to accommodate a bigger workforce than there is now. How do you intend to achieve and guarantee that the building is future proof uh, for the next 10 plus years? Uh, will you go sideways into the road? Great, okay. Neighbours, uh, underground, into the sand, or up to a fifth or sixth floor. Oh, uh, Liz first, and then Carly might want to come in. Um, so, so if I if I start, so um, I'm sure Carly will want to add this because Carly um, and Liz Brown, who you saw um, on the video, have been involved in um, a lot of meetings around the around the building. So we're really pleased that we've been able to um, design a building that's got more space than the current GP practices have in Tynmouth and also have enough space for the um, for the community teams and the other pe the other staff that we've uh, or other organisations that we've talked about. So we're really confident that the planners have done a really good um, good job with that. I don't know if you want to come in and um, uh, contribute, Carly. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the, I think this this has been a, a, a developing process and the first design that the architects put to us has it bears no relation to the, what, what we have now. Um, general practice services are changing all the time. Um, the uh, primary care network, I think it would be useful if I just spent a moment explaining that a little bit uh, before we get tangled in jargon. But before I do that, I think what if you just look at the rooms and the uh, consultation document has um, a sketch out of uh, the proposed floor plans, I suspect that those floor plans will still change. Not the outside design and shape of the building because that um, is, is, um, has been agreed um, in the pre-planning process as I understand it. But we are constantly reviewing those of us who are anticipating being in this new build if it goes ahead how we work, how we can um, make the best use of this space and how we can ensure that the space is flexible so that the rooms can be used in a different way in the future. Because if I look back over the 27 years I've been a GP, it, what I do now and how I work now and the teams I work with, the other participants in my team bear no relationship to what I'm doing now. So it's difficult to be absolutely certain what, that, what the use of this building will be in. 10 years and certainly in 20 years time, because it is, if that is, in, I, I can't tell you what that is and I don't think any of us could. But what is really key is that we have a space that is fit for purpose, uh, accessible, and by that I mean to all patients, including disabled patients and staff, um, and that we can use that space flexibly as our needs change. Um, just to go back very briefly to the primary care network, what that is, is a grouping. Um, the, these these um, entities came into existence um, just over 12 months ago in July 9, 2019. Um, and they're groupings of GP practices. For us in Coastal, it was easy and logical because the GP practices in Timoth and Dawlish have been working together for many years in a collaborative manner, and it's formalised that collaboration. Um, the um, primary care networks have the additional ability, as well as working together and sharing good ideas, of being able to employ additional staff. Um, at the, 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 I won't go into a great long list of staff we can join, employ, but um, the initial um, staff were social prescribers pharm and pharmacy team we've initially um, focused on. And those members of staff are shared across the practices 
physically in, in each of our practice buildings. So they will be in, in this building if it goes ahead, but they will also be in Dawlish, they will be in Tina Street Medical Group, they're in our branch surgery in um, Bishop Stainton and in Shudley. So they don't all need to be in the same place at the same time. And we will have to be very sensible and careful of where we place people so that we use all our building capacity to the maximum benefit for the patient services. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, next one, anonymous. Why do Dawlish get everything? Is it because they have a PFI hospital that cannot be closed? Surely the people of Tynmouth deserve a minor injury unit and operating theatres. Um, Paul. Uh, uh, thanks, Kevin. So I think when we when we look at what services we provide and where we, we have to look at what what the population needs and how close can we get it to that population. Uh, but also what are the facilities that we have available to us? And we do have a really modern fit for purpose hospital over at Dawlish and it would be remiss of the NHS not to use it in its full capacity um, because of the things that it can offer as opposed to some of the older uh, buildings that we, we currently also have. And that's where having a minor injuries unit and having, um, uh, having a day case surgery unit and looking at some of those specialist clinics will help us make sure that we use it to its maximum. So it is right, a lot of those services are going there, bearing in mind that particularly the specialist clinics and the and the day case surgery, the majority of people who use those come from throughout South Devon and Torbay, rather than it being particularly for the Tynmouth Dawlish population. But actually what we're doing within this consultation is we are trying to keep all those services that the people of Tynmouth use most within the Tynmouth area and that's where that eight million pound investment into the health and wellbeing centre is, uh, is is being put in to keep those in Tynmouth but to put them in a place that is fit for purpose. So all of those uh, frequently used uh, clinics like the podiatry and the physiotherapy and the audiology will still be in Tynmouth. The GPs in Tynmouth will have the most modern building with the most modern facilities and the added benefit of working with those community services. So, so there are some things that will have to come from the building that we have in Dawlish where we want to maximise its use. But actually, there is an awful lot that we want to make available to the people of Tynmouth for them to benefit and for their GPs to work much more closely with some of those services that we've already said. So it's a, it is a bit of both and we get that balance right for the whole of the population of Tynmouth and Dawlish. OK, thank you. Um, next one. Uh, this is a done deal, isn't it? Not a consultation. If these proposals go ahead, services in Tynmouth and surrounds will be decimated as there just aren't enough NHS services already, despite the claims being made. So where are all the extra staff uh, keeping, co uh, keeping folks in their own homes coming from? Um, Simon. Yeah, um, thanks, Kevin. So uh, no, it's not a done deal. It is a consultation. We are, as I've said, we, we've had in excess of 600 um, uh, views um, put to us and we'll need to work through those. And um, I'm sure, Kevin, you, you may wish to um, comment on the uh, on the fact that it's not a done deal, given that Health Watch are supporting the consultation um, uh, process. Um, and in terms of um, services will be decimated, I think it's really important, and Paul said this throughout the presentation, but maybe it's not landed. We are not taking services away. No services will be stopped. They are being relocated. Um, and in terms of being able to support um, people in their own homes, we're currently doing that, aren't we? And that's what Matt Fox, Dr. Matt Fox talked about in the video. We are already currently doing that. And because it's been so successful, that's why there's not the need for the 12 rehabilitation beds. So it's not about taking services away. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just thanks, thanks for that, Simon. Um, yeah, I, I just like to say that Health Watch is an independent charity and I and I know my team and volunteers wouldn't be involved in anything we, we thought was a sham. Uh, I've been along to the, you know, to save our hospital meetings and just, you know, explained what our, our kind of role in this is. So it's uh, it's really just to, to um, yeah, to, to hopefully uh, assure people that, that I would not be involved. Um, we think it's an ongoing process. We believe it's a, an open consultation and we're just we're just welcoming and encouraging everybody in the community to to come and tell us, you know, how they feel, what they think, uh, you know, what they're 
uh, what their concerns are and what their proposals are. So, um, so thanks for that opportunity to uh, to, to offer that hopeful, hopefully, as assurance. Uh, next one. Uh, as a patient at Glen Devon, my practice has been given good reasons as to why they are not moving. Will I and other patients be able to access uh, all the non-GP services in the new building, or are these just for channel view surgery? Uh, Liz. Thank you. It's a really good question and, and would want to reassure you straight away um, that all of those services are available to the whole community. So there will be no change to your ability to access that range of services that are provided in the community, which we've invested in over the last few years. So um, hopefully that reassures you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anonymous, uh, how can we genuinely complain about this process? It must be stopped. It's so flawed and ill-conceived at such a terrible time. Um, Paul. Uh, thank you, Kevin. So, so actually, the consultation is all about the chance for you to have your say. And I know when you're asking questions, we're coming back with answers um, uh, to those questions because it, there is an element that we have tried to consider all of these things already. But I am hearing from you that you are concerned that we're doing this during coronavirus. Um, I am hearing from you that you are concerned that a hospital that has been providing services for a long time is potentially closing and you're worried about what might be having happening around services uh, and 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 all of those asks of us to make sure that we hear what you're saying and we go back and we reconsider that and we will do um, and we want to hear that and more and only some people will be able to contribute in these meetings but other people will be able to fill in those forms online or in the consultation document or email or phone us and just have it, let us know your thoughts and your says. Health Watch will put all of that together. Um, they aren't going to screen out some things just because they might be unpalatable to us or because we don't want to hear it. So we will get the full range of views uh, from you. And then what we need to do is we need to be open and transparent in the way that we consider those views and then come to a decision. And that will happen in a governing body. So that's the board of the CCG will be meeting and we'll do it in public and we'll look at or the report that comes back from Health Watch, and we will make sure with our teams of executives such as Simon, our clinicians such as myself, and some of those non-executive uh, members, uh, many of whom are very invested in some of these this work that we're doing and want to do the right thing for patients. And we will do that with the information that Health Watch provide us. So, so have your say. Have your say now, and you are. Have your say uh, through the consultation document. And we will get all of that from Health Watch. But I do hear what you're saying. I do hear those concerns you're raising. And I will make sure that when we have that discussion in the governing body that I'll chair, that all of those things are talked about and that we make sure that we fully consider them before coming to a decision. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Paul. Um, right, next one is from Councillor Sylvia Russell. I've known Sylvia for many years, so more. Hi, Sylvia. Uh, who would like to say the new health hub will not be ready until 2022. It is confirmed that services will be moving to new sites at Torbay, Newton Abbott and Dawlish. But is it your plan to move services on and block or will there be a gradual closing of services at Tidmouth Hospital over a period of time? Um, Liz, I think. Thank you. And um, thank you, Councillor Russell. It's uh, good to see you or hear you today. Um, so just to provide reassurance, the services that are currently provided in um, in Timoth will continue to be provided in Timoth until the alternative arrangements are in place and safe transfer of those services has been completed. And in terms of where those services are going to go, um, the vast majority of services that are delivered in the health and wellbeing centre uh, in Timoth Hospital will be going to the health and wellbeing centre. That's about 73% of the current activity, including physio um, clinics, podiatry clinics, um, and audio, audiology clinics and actually ENT and the balance 27% um, 20, uh, of the activity will be going to um, Dawlish Hospital. So that is how those, that activity will be delivered and because we have flexibility in um, Dawlish Hospital we know that we can transfer those clinics to that environment without changing the days or their capacity um, in those environments. So, so just to be in a clear um, we will transfer when it's safe to do so. Um, they will be going to the Health and Wellbeing Centre and to Dawlish. And um, in the meantime, all services will be maintained. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, this is from James in Tidmouth. 
Uh, when will the public find out the result of this consultation? And if agreed, what is the timeline for building uh, on moving services? And Paul, I think. Uh, thanks. So I think Liz, uh, Liz has sort of covered sort of the timeline for that moving of the services, and it is very much dependent upon when the facilities are available. Um, apologies, someone's just started printing to my right, so apologies for the noise. Um, but um, as far as when the public will find out, that's the process where we as a CCG will get the information from Health Watch and we will then have that public meeting of our governing body where we will come to a decision based on uh, the feedback from the consultation. Uh, I don't know the exact date of that, but we will make sure that we publicise it both on uh, on our website, um, but we'll make sure that it's on things like social media uh, and so on. And if you want to make sure that you're contacted with the information and the details of that, then if you email us at the CCG and we'll make sure that we uh, we tell you uh, the date and time at which that's happening. And then once that decision is made, we will we will make it public again through the social media, through our website uh, and 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 through through other means. And certainly Health Watch, I'm sure will play a part in disseminating uh, the result of that consultation. So we will try and keep it open and advertise it as much as possible. But if in any doubt, just email us and ask us to keep you in the loop of when those dates are. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, this one, I think, is probably for uh, Simon. Let's see. Uh, it's a three part question from Anonymous. Uh, three part question, if I may. Will the GP's one million secured from NHS England's improvement primary care estates funding be used solely to fund the GP part of the new centre or the whole building? Uh, what happens to Glen Devon's patient share of the funding if they do not move? Assuming it will remain and go into the new building, will some of the rooms be available to use by the other practice? So who would like to pick this one up? So, so I'll, I'll start, Kevin. Um... Carly may um, may want to come in, um, particularly around the last one. But if I answer it, um, or try to answer it um, first, so the 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 bid, the one million pounds that's referenced was um, uh, the Estates and Technology Transformation Fund, and that bid was um, quite a while ago now. The reason that was successful was because it was an integrated bid, so that it included health and social care, community, voluntary sector, etc. Now, whilst it is to fund the GP element of the building, the money has been put into the pot to build uh, to build all of it. In terms of the Glen Devon share, it's it's not allocated to the GP practices; it was to the project. So, with Glen Devon choosing not to move to the building, there's no share as such to the. For the for the patients of Glen Devon, but as Liz said earlier, access to all the community clinics, voluntary sector, etc., will still be open to all patients of uh, and residents of Tynmouth, um, uh, regardless of where they're um, registered in terms of their GP practice. In terms of G, uh, Glen Devon having access to rooms, that would need to be discussion between. Um, either Liz's community team or um, Carly's uh, practice. I'm sure they will show as much flexibility um, as they can, but that would really be a decision for for them to uh, for them to make. I don't know if you want to come in on that, Carly. Thank you very much. Um, I think there's the the bit I was referring to before about pr the primary care network. Um, the primary care network that we work in is made up of Bath and Surgery and Dawlish. Teen Estuary Medical Group, so that's Glen Devon and Shoals and Surgeries, um, and my own Ch Childview Medical Group. Um, we all work together, so staff who work for the primary care network, um, if they are based in that working from this new centre, should it go ahead, um, would be working for on behalf of all the practices. Um, and we share out the time proportionally for our, across our list size. Um, so um, I would be very happy to have any conversations about shared working and continue the collaboration that we have. That start that has started many years ago when we there were far more buildings than there are now and far more practices and continues and develops and I think is being strengthened um, month on month, year on year, and I'd be very keen to, to pursue that. Um, the other thing that I thought I ought to make clear is the, the plan, the floor plan that has been in the um, uh, documentation um, includes space for, um, as it was drawn at the time, for the Glen Devon patients. So that um, it, that space is is still there and needs to be redesigned, remodelled if um, those that that practice doesn't join and can be reconfigured. But um, 
at the moment that if you look at the floor plan of number of um, GP rooms, treatment rooms, those sorts of things, uh, that was how it was originally drawn out and is still on there at the moment. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. I'm just looking at my list and that appears to be the, the final question. Um, what I'd like to really do is just give all panellists uh, an opportunity to, to sort of close, give some sort of final closing remarks, any reflections, anything they'd actually like to say um, about how you found this morning, anything that, that's been missed out or whatever. Um, and possibly uh, if any more questions come in, I will break in, break in, so I don't want to miss anything. But uh, Liz, would you like to give some closing reflections? Okay. Yes, yeah, thank you, um, Kevin. And I've uh, really um, found this morning useful because I think we've heard some uh, new and some consistent issues. I suppose from my perspective, what we're trying to do is to make sure that we've got the type of services for the Timoth and Dawlish community that ensures that people are able to have the sort of lives they want in their own homes for as long as possible. And our aspiration is to deliver on that. We know having fit for purpose buildings that bring people together um, has evidenced, uh, well, we've evidenced in, in, in Timmouth and Dawlish already what a big difference that makes for local people. And we want to build on that. I think what I've heard from people today, um, which I think is important for us to take away, is the importance around having the continuity of services and know pe that people can have services um, through this transition, that the access issues are really important to people and make sure that people can get what they need when they need to do it. I think I've also heard a very clear message around COVID and, and us, the importance of us being able to demonstrate to people that these arrangements are going to be fit for purpose through the COVID pandemic and in the um, with the outcome of what the COVID pandemic um, will bring. And finally, ensuring that the building, um, which is a, a significant investment in the local community, is fit for purpose in a number of ways. And I, I don't think we can lose sight of the fact that parking is something that people want us to have um, an answer to as well. So um, hopefully that captures a few of the themes. I'm sure my colleagues will pick up on others. But thank you for your time today. And um, Simon. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Kevin. So Liz has covered a few of the things um, that I would have said, but it's always good to be able to have um, a, an engaging conversation with people. And there's clearly a lot of passion um, around um, Timothy and Dawlish and the and the discussions that we're having. I suppose my if I take our um, conversation and reflections in a slightly different um, area, because obviously Liz has covered some good points there is the the independence i think it's really important that this consultation is being independently run through health watch so there's you know a number of questions and comments about um or, you know implication that it's a done deal that it's a sham that nobody's listening so i just want people to go away and remember that this is being run through um through health watch it's not being run by the ccg We've come up with the with the options and the um, uh, and the the paperwork, but actually Health Watch are running the feedback, and we'll make sure that it stays independent and fair. Thanks, Kevin. And Carly. Sorry, a slight delay in my uh, finger on the button. Then I do apologise. Um, I think my reflection would be that uh, this process is about buildings, but it's also about services. Um, it is vitally important we have fit for purpose buildings with sufficient space um, to deliver services. But the, the overwhelming, um, my overwhelming feeling is that um, it's vital that um, as a GP who's been working in the area for 27 years, that I don't sit back and say, well, we're, we're pro providing a pretty good service. And if you look at the feedback all the GP surgeries in, in Timoth and Dawlish get, um, it is good and our patients um, are very, seem to be very happy with what we're doing, um, but we should never ever sit on our laurels and say, well, it's good enough and um, we'll carry on as we are. We, it's really important that we constantly review what we're doing, look at opportunities to work differently together, and that's both as GPs working differently within our own surgeries, working differently with each other, neighbouring surgeries, and working dif working differently with all the other teams that that we um, rub up against in order to deliver care for patients. 
Um, I think the Health and Wellbeing Centre builds on the um, really good working relationship we've, we have between GP services, the community health services and with social care and with the voluntary sector. So I'm really keen to um, help uh, facilitate a process that continues to improve all that provision. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to uh, join this consultation. Okay, and uh, Paul, final comment. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, I think my final comment um, is um, that I think we want the same thing. Um, I think you are here um, in this conversation because you want the best for the people of Timoth, uh, and so do we. Um, uh, that we want people in Timoth to live long, healthy lives. We want people in Timoth to be able to access the care they need when they need it and to access the medical care and uh, and support when they become unwell so they've got the best chance of recovering. Um, and, I, and, and I think that is the common ground we've got. And what I'm hearing from you is that you are hugely passionate about that and you will protect that um, as much as as much as you can. And we do not want to put that under threat. I think what where we have our discussion is that it's not easy working out what's the best way to do that. Uh, and we haven't come to this consultation in an easy, straightforward process. Um, uh, and and you haven't come to your views uh, without due consideration. So so I think that demonstrates just how important this is, just how passionate both you and the panel and the team behind the panel are. Uh, and. I'm, what I'm looking forward to doing is working with everything that you have said to us and everything that you are going to say to us through this consultation and making sure that we pay proper attention to it and that we come to an answer at the end that to the best of our skills and our abilities and your views and your contributions we think is the right thing to do and then when we've done it we make sure that we carry on giving the right attention and resources and focus on what we do going forward so that actually it does bear results and you do get the care and support uh, and health that uh, that you want and that you deserve. So so thank you um, uh, for your time. Uh, and I think it's it's a hugely valuable process and I hope that together we can do the right thing for you. Thank you, Pavel. And um, that's pretty much the end of today's meeting. And we said we'd finish at, um, at half past. So we, we've timed it just about perfectly. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to thank everybody for being involved. It's taken the time to to um, dial in this morning. I'd really like to thank residents. I'd like to thank the people who are so dedicated to, to our NHS out in the community. And I'd also like to thank the panel for their insight, the information today. I'd like to uh, further thank the people behind the scenes, that CCG staff. And I'd like to thank my HealthWatch staff and my HealthWatch volunteers for um, working behind the scenes and making sure those questions actually came through. That's That's terrific. Thanks, everybody. I uh, hope you found it interesting and uh, it doesn't finish here. So uh, it's it's really trying to uh, give you um, information on coming to a view about the CCG's proposal. And on um, the slide that's just come up is just how you can actually continue to get involved by reading the consultation document. That's been sent out to 16,000 households, so you should have had one if you live in this patch. Uh, many more leaflets have actually gone out. So please do fill in the survey online or the consultation document. Uh, if you have community meetings, community interaction, let us know, as we said earlier, and we'll we'll try and sort of react to those uh, those um, requests as they actually come in. And uh, do request a telephone call. I've got my Health Watch volunteers helping out on that. If, if you've got any issues about filling in forms, please let us know. We really want to sort of help out on that one. And uh, uh, there's the emails or the contact details there. Uh, we've also like to know how you think how the format, the meeting format went. It's unusual. I don't think we've done this before. And um, this whole digital thing, it's a whole new world for a lot of us. And as, as you found out earlier, sometimes the uh, the IT doesn't work perfectly. So the links are links actually up there. And I'm pretty much um, I'll call that uh, call that the end of the meeting. Again, my personal thanks. Uh, thanks to everybody involved. Have a wonderful afternoon and uh, just let us know how you think. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. Bye bye.